Hello friends and welcome to Zionville. Is John 3.16 telling us the truth? What kind of a question is that? That's the most well-known verse in the Bible. Of course it's telling us the truth, isn't it? Yes, it's true. But as we'll see, some people unwittingly make a lie out of it. And such a mistake to anyone who continues to believe it has fatality attached to it. Please listen to this study carefully. John 3.16 reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3 and verse 16. Quite a lot is packed into this one verse, including something from the apostolic church long forgotten today, which begs the question asked above. Let's have a look then. First, just a little bit of backstory. When I first came to the Lord in August 1977, I didn't know one verse of Scripture, not one, not even John 3.16. Anything I learned previously, especially from the nuns of my Catholic childhood, was long forgotten, or at least those things weren't part of my conscious thoughts, so darkened as they were at the time when I was practicing only evil continually, as in the days of Noah, Genesis 6.5. Those days were certainly anything but oriented towards the Lord for me. So John 3.16 wasn't on my radar at all, nor was anything else that is written in the Scriptures. But the Lord drew me to himself and told me to go get a Bible and study it, and especially, he said, about the end times. I bought one that very day, and I began to learn, and I have never stopped. The most important thing to learn was concerning the defects of my character, which is still in progress. Sanctification is indeed the work of a lifetime. I think John's words were among the first things I read as I surrendered myself and my life to Christ. I saw myself a sinner deserving of the hellfire punishment prepared for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25, 41. Forty-four and a half years later, as I speak today, I'm still endeavoring to surrender daily as he helps me to grow in grace, learning to leave sin behind while he perfects my character step by step from faith to faith, Romans 1.17. This is what he wants for us all as the return of his son draws near, Ephesians 5.25-27. Are we listening or are we still following the world and its ways? So then, exactly how does John 3.16 instruct us, given the times we are living in? Now let's look at our verse one part at a time. For God so loved. It is still amazing to me today that God loves me, and you. In 1977, I saw, as I see now, that there is absolutely nothing to recommend me or any of us to heaven and to God. I have sinned broken God's commandments, 1 John 3 and verse 4, probably hundreds of thousands of times in thought, word, and deed over the course of my life. And since the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23, there is therefore nothing to recommend me to heaven. I only deserve death, eternal death. But we are told that God so loved us, loved us, so much so, in fact, that he did something for us. And he did it for us all. He did it for the world. As we are told next in our text, no one is left out. Jesus is Savior for everyone on earth in all ages. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, Acts 4.12. So what exactly did he do? He gave. That bespeaks a gift, something we cannot buy but only accept. We did nothing to earn it. It is a gift. So let us not look the gift horse in the mouth, as the saying goes, but gladly accept it, and that gratefully. And what exactly did God the Father give us? This is where, in particular, we focus on apostolic days before the apostasy of the later times to understand that it mu this as it must be understood. So what did he give us? His only begotten Son is the answer. Yes, God has a son, according to the scriptures, Proverbs 30 and verse 4. Was God lying? No. Was he merely accommodating himself to us lower creatures by speaking in terms of a father-son relationship, something we could understand as most churches have it now? No. 
or is there a reality here that is missed? Yes. Indeed, what was meant and understood in apostolic times is very rare today due to false doctrine that has changed the meaning of John 3.16. This is why people today make a lie out of the verse and don't even realize it. It comes from where they have been taught, uh, from what they have been taught all their lives, and they see no contradiction. You see, <clears throat> back in Bible times, people took the Bible at face value. They took it as it reads. The common people heard him gladly, we're told. The humble shepherds at his earthly birth, the mothers in Israel during his ministry, and so on. That was just natural and normal. That is how you read historical accounts. So when the Bible asked about the name of God's Son in Proverbs 30, verse 4, the first thing uh, that that question told them was that he had a son, and they didn't question that. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Proverbs 30 and verse 4. And that is because the horde of Christian theologians hadn't come along yet with their theological debating and their political motivations under the aegis of the haughty pontiffs. They had some precursors in Judaism, but nothing like what it became in the Christian era. Proverbs is very clear. What is his son's name? So, God was not lying. No lie is of the truth, remember, 1 John 2, 21. And in fact... It was Jesus himself speaking in the grammatical third person in John 3.16 who told us that he was really God's only begotten son. And like the people in Bible times, we are to take this exactly as it reads, as it would normally be understood, not as new modeled by churchmen since apostolic days. And there is a hoary history of that both without and within Christianity. They threw out the begotten part of only begotten and retained only the only. Thus, modern versions say something like one and only son or only son or unique son. While Jesus is all of these things, they completely throw out the birth part, the came forth part, his begottenism. And this is why people today don't know it. The Greek word for only begotten is a compound word, monogonase only generated, and you must use both parts. But Satan wanted to be sure to get rid of the fact that Christ is the literal Son of God begotten, brought forth from the Father in eternity past, as in Proverbs 8, for instance. He hates Christ. This belief in God the Father and His only begotten Son is the core belief that renders both proper biblical understanding and then personal salvation. Jesus says it is salvific in the first five words of John 17, 3. Do you care to argue with him? And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, John 17, 3. To disbelieve that God Most High has a Son, a real one made of his divine substance, will result in eternal loss, no future life after the judgment is over because such persons have no Savior and will die in their sins. It's that simple. In Luke 8, 28, the demon-possessed men of Gadara knew Jesus was the Son of the Most High. And today, these same demons tell men through their pastors and other church leaders that he is not. Wake up to Satan's tactics, friends. Time is short. And do not laugh this off. Ellen White says a lot about Satan's tactics too much for this short video. In fact, I've cut a lot of my own comments out of this too. To be sure, it is easy to, easy to understand and to the main point. You can do a little dig digging and find out way more. To sum up then, the biblical reality of Jesus' Godhead, his divinity, divine nature, deity, is not dependent on how many eons he has been around, but rather on who his father is. He is entirely it is entirely the principle of like begets like as seen in Genesis 1. In this case, deity brought forth begat deity, but without the sexuality humans must use, of course. God doesn't need that. 
All the patriarchs in Genesis begat, as did their heavenly father before them, sex apart, because humans are otherwise modeled after deity in that they generate descendants. The only difference is we have many of them to perpetuate the race, but Jesus is the father's only begotten. He was born, brought forth, that is begotten, of the Father, who is God. Therefore, the Son is also God in nature, full deity. He just isn't the Father. He is the same in divine nature as the Father, but not in personality, his personhood. He is the Son of God, not the Most High God. They are two different persons, not part of the strange papal amalgamation of the Trinity, which is a non-existent false God. How simple and clear can you get? Thank God for the perspicuity, that is, the clarity of Scripture. Now, finally, the inspired apostle ends John 3.16 this way. And remember, it is Jesus speaking, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a promise. Thus, faith in him, the only begotten Son, as presented by Christ himself, not a non-existent, co-eternal, nor created being, or Trinitarian amalgamation, is essential to everlasting life. Anything short of this will bring disaster. This is what Scripture says, not me. Yes, this is what our verse, John 3.16, teaches us about God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus the Messiah. He said it. Study this for yourself. I believe you will see it in time. It is clear all throughout the Bible, everywhere present, very consistently. And finally, if the Trinitarian formula and its cousin Tritheism, three co-eternal, co-equal gods, were correct, then John 3.16 is a lie and so much else in Scripture besides. We would have no salvation, but we know that God has not inspired lies, nor did Jesus ever speak them. The lies came from the devil through wicked churchmen. The Father and the Son are not co-equal, co-eternal persons, regardless of what Babylon says. That idea and the enforced creedal statements concerning it do not fit the biblical facts. And neither is the Son a created being. He is a begotten being. Huge difference. Therefore, today, we all, Seventh-day Adventists, in or out of the conference, along with any other interested parties from all the churches of Babylon, need to rethink, revive, and reform what we believe concerning the three great powers of heaven. And by the way, watch the videos on this channel concerning the Spirit of God and of Christ, a totally misunderstood doctrine also. They have not been teaching the truth on this either. I invite you to trust God enough to watch them. The result will be real peace. I thank God and his son for giving me peace back in 2014 after 60 years of wanting to know. May you be blessed with his true peace and understanding as well. And may we thus all grow in grace and understanding of the one true God and his son at this crucial point in history as we ready ourselves for the Lord's soon coming with the help of the Spirit of Christ. Maranatha.